Welcome! In this series of videos, we will cover the design and implementation of a project, from initial design through coding and development to testing, using the PowerBasic Windows Compiler. Today, we will continue our project to look at the use of software auto forms. This was our application at the end of the last video. We have created a generic PowerBasic Windows application which has a single dialog. The objects on this dialog are configured outside the application. They are configured in a configuration file. In this case, the test demo CFG file. As this configuration file is indeed a CSV file, a comma separated variable file, I'm going to change the extension of the name from CFG to CSV. This will allow me to use a small application which I created in PowerBasic to use my little grid to display CSV files. This makes it much easier to see on screen. So the objects we have defined on our configurable dialog are to set the title, to designate two buttons to appear on the dialog, for two labels and two text boxes. What we're going to do today is we're going to extend this further and add a couple more objects on screen. Tell us to have a drop down list and a list box. Additionally, we're going to set up the save function, which will be triggered when the OK button is clicked. So let's have a look at the code. To enable some of this new functionality, I'm going to add a new library to our application, the Common Strings library. We're going to add this just before the existing library that does the file handling routines. So if we open our CSV file up in Notepad, we're going to add some more lines of configuration to this file. I want to add two new objects, each of these objects having its own label. One to allow the user to select a department that this new user is going to appear in. The second to be a list box which will contain a list of skills. So first of all our department label, positioning this on screen and giving it an ID value of 2004. Underneath that we're going to set our first drop down list. This will be the combination of a label box and a drop down. So the user will be able to select from this drop down list, but will not be allowed to key any free text in. Additionally, we will set this so that it's sorted. So we will tackle this one first, and then we will come back to do the list box. The drop down list needs to contain a number of values. Rather than store these within this configuration file, I have designated in the text column a file name, department.txt. This file is going to contain the list of departments. This allows us to keep the configuration file neat and tidy and to hold the configuration for this particular object in a separate file. So how do we set this up on the screen? The first change I need to make is to the populate form function. This is a function that takes the information in our global array and will position the controls on screen. We need to add a new case statement to handle our drop down list. As we have done before, we're going to be pulling the information out of our configuration array. However, as we need to populate the data in this drop down list, we're going to be using an array as well. This will be the STR data array. So we'll need to configure that and we'll need to populate it as well. Plus, for this combo box, there are some styles we'll also need to populate before we call the control add combo box command. So we will set these local variables up at the top of our code. One to dimension the array, uh, one for the style, one for the extended style, and one for the file. This will be the file that contains the department names. So we will set the style and the extended style at the beginning of our code. These define how the combo box actually behaves and looks on screen. Next, we have to determine whether the combo box is to be sorted or not. So we're using the function column in our configuration array to determine that. That will set the CBS sort value onto the end of the style. Next, we have to pick up the text column to determine the text file that contains all our department names, just as we did with the other reference data. We can then test for the presence of that file. If that file exists, we'll use the function in our common library to read the file into our array. But as you will have noticed, there is a new global string, the configuration folder string. 
This is the one that tells us the folder that contains our configuration information. We'll need to set this one up. We're using this global string to determine the location of all the configuration files, as there will be more of them. So let's see where in the code we set that up. If we go right back to our pbmain function. In the pbmain function, we're testing for the configuration file. This is the one that's been passed in on the command line. We test to see if the file does not exist and give the user a message box to let them know that the program cannot launch because there is no configuration file. We're going to put an else command in here to store the path of the configuration file. And we're going to be using one of the functions in the library we just added today. This is the start range parse function. This will allow us to store the relative path from our executable folder to the config folder, allowing us to use this later on in the program. So in our function, we are picking up the name of the file which contains the text of all the departments. We're testing to see if that file exists. We're reading the file into an array and we're using that array to populate the combo box. So what we need now is a list of departments. So we will create a department.txt file in our configs folder. This contains a small list of departments and this should appear in our combo box. And since our configuration has set to sort this list, it should sort them into alphabetical order. So before we run our application, we'll make sure that we have actually declared this new global variable. Now that's in place, we should be able to run our application. And there is our application dialog on screen. We now have a new department drop down. And if we click on the drop down, we will see that it does indeed contain the list of departments we specified in alphabetical order. So we've achieved setting up combo boxes, which are drop downs. Our next task is to add on the list box, which will appear under the skill label. So back into our populate form function to add this new object. Just as we did for our drop down list, we're adding a new case statement for the list box. And having set the styles, we can now add in the test to see if we're using the sort option or not. And the style we're adding is LBS sort, which is the style for list boxes. And exactly as we did before, since this list box is to contain a list of skills, it will indeed be held in a file. So we will apply exactly the same code as we did for the combo box. We will pick up the text value, which is the name of the file. We will test for the presence of the file and we will load that into the array using our inbuilt function. And the final task in this section is to use the control add OS box command, positioning it on screen with the array, which contains the data, populating it. So if we try running that code now, we see that the list box is now on screen. The difference, as you can see, between a list box and a combo box is the list box displays all the data at one time. And since we added the sort option, it is sorted alphabetically. So now that we've added a number of different controls to our form, what we're going to look at next is what happens when the user clicks on the OK button. As this form is designed as a data entry form, what we want to do is when the OK button has been clicked is to gather the information from the objects on the screen and to save that to an external file. Once we've established the principle of saving this data to a local file, it could be amended to save the data anywhere else, including sending it to a database. So we're going to create a new folder called data and it's into this folder we're going to be saving our information. So in our code folder, we're going to create a brand new folder and we'll call that folder data. The first thing that needs to be done is to amend our control processing to handle the clicking on the OK box. So if we have a look at the run control process function, this is a function that runs and picks up the events from your dialog. In here we have the event which handles the exit from the dialog. We've already prepared an event for saving data. This is the one we're now going to populate. So we're going to be using a new function, save form data. This function takes two parameters. The first being the handle of the control the user has just clicked on, the OK button. And the second is the word field name. As you will see from our config file, the field name is a brand new column. This column is going to contain information we will need to actually use to determine where we want to save the data. 
So we'll see in the OK button, we have a value in the field name of data slash user data dot CSV. This is specifying the relative folder path and name of file that we wish to save the data to. Additionally, the fields we wish to extract the data from are actually named in the field name column. So the text box that contains the name, we're going to save to a column in the file called name, additionally for the address, then the department, and then the skill. This gives you a method by which you can specify in the configuration file which columns need to be extracted from the dialog and placed within the output file. So let's create this new save form data function. So here is the template for a new function taking its two parameters, first being the control and the second being the field name in a configuration file that we wish to read. Our first task is to determine where to save the data. We need to pull the value out of our configuration file, which contains the path and the name of the file we wish to save. So we will create some local variables to allow us to do this. Since we're going to be pulling information out of this configuration file for a few entries with this field value, we want to actually create a little function whose job it is to pull that information out for us to make it easy to get at it. So I'm going to reference a new function which we will create in a moment. The use of these functions makes your coding much easier to read and much easier to do. So we'll call this new function return field value. It passes the two parameters we've received in this function onto the new function, the control handle and the field name we're interested in. And this will return a piece of text that sits in our configuration file, which will be in this case, this value here, data slash user data dot CSV. And we can use the same function later when we need to pull this additional information out, which is the name of the column we're going to be saving to the file. So we will return in a moment and create that new function but we'll push on here in this function and complete the work. When the application is run for the first time, this output file will not exist. So if the file does not exist, we'll want to output the headers, the names of the columns that we want to put into the file so that the CSV file when created is useful. So we can test using the isFile function to see if the file exists. If the file does not exist, we want to output the headers to the file. But at the moment, we don't have the headers. So we would need another function to define what those headers actually are. We can then pass that as a parameter to the file handling routines function append to file. This will create the file and send the data into it. We'll create that new function in a moment. But on the assumption that we've got the file headers, we've created the file, we now have to get the form data. So it's going to be yet another function which we'll write shortly. We'll call that get form data. So having got the form data into an STR data variable, we can then append that to the end of the file we created a few moments ago. So that will create this particular function, but we're going to have to create these three new functions to actually do the work. So first of all, we'll tackle the return field value function. Each of these functions is going to be doing a similar task. We're passing in the control handle and the field we're interested in. And this function will need to look inside the configuration array to work out what needs to be returned. So we're going to be using another function in our common strings library called parse find, which is particularly good at finding data in strings. We have in a previous video used constants to work out which column in the configuration file things actually sit in. This is fine until somebody actually changes the configuration file to add an extra column in. What we're doing now is using a dynamic way of finding out exactly where in the configuration file the ID column actually sits. This makes it quite generic and allows you to add additional columns to the configuration file without having to change your code. So this parse find function takes three parameters. The first being the string we wish to interrogate. The second parameter is the delimiter. Since this uses the parse command under the hood, we're giving it a zero in string as the delimiter, which will default to CSV handling. The final parameter is the column in which we have an interest, in this case, the ID column. And the return from this function is the column number that it finds this ID column in. If the value is zero, the column was not found. Next, we will use the parseFind function to find the column number that we're interested in. 
in this case the field name. Having determined both of these columns, we can now do a for next loop to look around every entry in the config file until we find the entry or the OK button. If the value in the ID column matches the control that we're interested in, then we've found the data line. Then we can use a simple parse command to pull back the data from the field column. This, in this case, will tell us exactly what the name and path to the file we want to save actually is. And as I said earlier, we can use this return field value function in other places in our code. So the next function we want to actually set up is the getConfigHeaders function. This is doing a remarkably similar task. This takes no parameters and is looking for the object and the field name columns. So if we look at our config file, we can see the only objects we are interested in, the ones containing user data, are the text objects, the drop down list, and the list box. So we're going to use a for next loop to sweep through our config file to pull that information out, and using the parse command again to pull out the entry in the object column. And if it says text, drop down list, or list box, then that's the column we're interested in. So we can then pull the information out that exists within that column and we can add it on to our header variable. This is what we're going to write out to our file. And once we've been around that loop, we then trim off any trailing commas and we return that to the function that called this function. So that completes the calling for the get config headers. So our final function in here is one to get the form data itself. This is to get the information the user has actually keyed in on screen. And again, this is doing something very similar. We need to look for the object columns and the ID column. The object column, because we're only interested in a certain number of objects, and the ID column will give us the Windows ID of the object on the dialog. We can then get the text that exists on the dialog using that information. Again, another for next loop. So we can use a select case statement to pick up the value in our object column. If it's text or drop down list, we can use control get text to pull the information off the dialog. If it's a list box, we can use the list box get text command to pull the information back in a similar way. And since this is putting the information into the str data variable, we now have to add that on to the row data. So we're building up the row from each column. So since the output is going to be a CSV file, we're wrapping all the text we're sending out in double quotes followed by a comma. And as we did before, our final task is to trim off any trailing commas at the end of our row data. Then we can return to the calling function the whole string that needs to be sent out to the file. And that string gets returned into this data variable here, which is the entire row to be written to the file. Then our append to file function opens the file, sends the data to it, and then closes the file again. So this should complete all the information in our application to allow us to take the information the user keys on screen and sends to our output file. So as we will see at the moment, our data folder is entirely empty. So before we run our application, we'll also have to put in a list of skills. We have the department file in there, but we have not yet copied in the skill file. So let's paste that in, just to make sure that's got all the skills in it. So there are our skills. So if we run our application now, we should have both the departments and the skills populated. So there is our departments, and there are our skills. So let's try running the application now to see if we can extract the data on screen and if it saves to the file. And if we hit the OK button, let's see if that's saved to our file. Well, we do indeed have a user data file and it has pulled back the information on screen, the name, the address, the department, and the skill. However, there is a little more we need to do to our application as it's a data entry screen. After having keyed in information and hit the OK button, we would expect some feedback to the user to let them know that the information had been saved, and then to clear the entries on the screen to allow the next entry to be keyed in. So let's go back to the code and put those changes in. So in our run control process function, where we're handling the click on the button, we've got the save form data. So if the form data for some reason cannot be saved, we'll need to give the user some kind of feedback to say there's a problem. 
But we need something on screen that's fairly obvious for the user to let them see that there has been a problem or that there has been a successful save. So we will add a new control on the screen to give feedback to the user, a status field. So we're adding a new label, which is going to be our status field, and it will currently say ready. I'm going to set the color of that to blue. And we're going to make the font a little bit bigger so that the user will be able to see it quite easily. And in the cleanup section, we're going to be deleting the font once the dialog is closing down. And we will also declare the font at the beginning of our code. Although I'm doing this in the code itself, it's probably easier done within the forms designer. So that gives us a section of the dialog which will feed back to our user. So if for any reason we are unable to save the form, the return from the save form data function will be false. In which case we can put a message on screen in that new status field to say the form has not been saved. If the form has been saved, we can then tell the user form saved. But we're going to add two additional functions here. One to reset the form to blanket all the data and one to set the focus back to the beginning field on the form. So let's create, first of all, the reset form function. This function will look quite familiar to what we've seen already. We'll again have to pick up the object column and the ID column from our configuration array. And having picked up that information, we're then going to go through a for next loop. And within that for next loop, we're picking up the control value from the ID column. We're then testing the object column. And if it's text, we're using a control set text to blank out the text in our text boxes. If it's a drop down list, we're using the combo box unselect to deselect any value the user selected in the combo box. And something very similar for our list box, we're using a list box unselect. Should we add any more controls to the system, later on in the project, we'll need to add to this function to handle blanking out that as well. So now that we have blanked out all the editable fields on the form, we now have to set the focus back to the first editable object. We had a piece of code in the previous video that performed this function. So we're going to borrow that code and put it into a function of its own. You'll find when you're doing projects, there will become times when you discover that you're writing a piece of code more than once. If that's the case, then it's crying out for a common function. That way you can just call the common function as many times as you wish in your code, and it only exists in one place. So should you need to make a change to that common function, it's very easy to make, and saves delving through a great deal of code to make the same change in several places. So we're going to call this new function setFocus to start form. And as we've done before, it's doing a very similar task looking at the configuration array. It's a standard for next loop. And we're interested in the text, the drop down list, and the list boxes. And the very first one of those we find, we're setting the focus to that control and then exiting immediately. So we need to call this new function immediately after having blanked all the fields on the user's form. So if we add the call to this new function, let's try running the application now to see if it clears the form and sets the focus to the first editable object. And there we have the form save message coming up, and everything on screen has either been blanked out or deselected. Now this should have added to our output file, so we should have two records in that. So let's exit the application and have a quick look at our output file. And there indeed is our output file with both sets of data in it. So in summary, what we've done today, we have added to our generic application the ability to handle simple drop down boxes and list boxes on forms, all configured in the metadata contained in the configuration CSV file. Additionally, when the user clicks on the OK or Save button, this will save the information that's currently on the screen in the dialog to a CSV text file. This will allow data to be built up in that text file for later processing in other systems. What we will do in the next video is we will allow the setting up of fields which are mandatory or non-mandatory. We can also set the maximum length of text fields or have text fields which are designated as being numbers only. But we'll leave all that for the next video. Hopefully you'll find this code useful in your applications, but that's it for today. Thank you for watching.